this, uh, the, this is on, yes. No. no. Is it on now? Yes. Yes. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, I should like once again to thank uh, Hans and uh, Guccin uh, for their uh, wonderful and magnificent hospitality. Um, uh, the search for truth is, of course, very gratifying, uh, but to search for truth in the Carrier Princess Hotel is a paradise. <laughs> well, uh, at first I should issue a health warning. Uh, I'm going to mention smoking, and I know that there are some enthusiastic smokers in the audience, uh, but of course we have no taboos, so I, I can mention it. Uh, well, the British government uh, recently proposed to make it illegal for anyone to smoke in any vehicle, including in private uh, cars. And the justification for this proposal was as follows. It's generally thought, on the basis of epidemiological evidence, that children brought up with parents who smoke are more likely to develop chest infections, uh, chest conditions such as bronchiolitis, and to suffer uh, from severe exacerbations of asthma if they suffer from asthma. Asthmatic children of smoking parents have to go to hospital more often and stay longer than asthmatic children of non-smoking parents. The risk of children suffering from other conditions such as middle ear disease is 35% greater if parents smoke than if they don't. And parents who smoke uh, more than double the risk of a child uh, suffering from bacterial and meningitis. So it seems obvious, or intuitively obvious, that smoking in a small and confined space such as a car uh, is not likely to be good for children's health. And indeed, smoking in a car raises particulate contaminants uh, of the air to more than 100 times the recommended levels. Now, let me just here interpose a warning for general consumption, as it were. When epidemiological evidence or information is relayed to the general public, it's often in the following form, that consumption of product X, say, doubles the risk of development of uh, disease Y. The significance of this information for most people, however, uh, crucially depends upon the absolute, not the relative risks. The doubling of, of a risk of developing a disease that normally occurs uh, one in five million people is not really worth worrying about. And a small increase in the relative uh, risk of developing a very common condition can be of significance in absolute numbers. And only rarely, I think, are these things made plain to the public in the reporting of epidemiological studies, and they're sometimes, in fact quite often, not made in the medical literature themselves. These, these, these things are not made clear. And this, uh, one suspects, is because scientific research and public advocacy are not nearly as distinct as one might suppose that they are, or perhaps that they ought to be. Well, a couple of absolute figures for the risk of children uh, of smoking by their parents might now be in order. It's estimated that in Britain, I'm talking about Britain, I hope you'll forgive me for using British statistics, it's estimated that there are 9,500 extra hospital admissions a year uh, because of asthma necessitated by the smoking of parent, uh, by parents of asthmatic uh, children. Uh, that, however, is one in a thousand children per year. We need to keep all these figures in mind. The death, um, it's estimated that 200 cases of bacterial meningitis a year are attributable uh, to smoking by parents. Uh, and the death rate from this disease is between 5 and 10% even when adequately treated, and the permanent neurological damage is uh, 10 to 20% of cases. That is to say, between 10 and 20 children a year die, and between 20 and 40 a year suffer from permanent neurological damage, for example, deafness, uh, because of parental smoking. Now, these uh, figures translate to something between 
one in a million and one in 250,000 children. I'm assuming here, for the sake of argument, that these figures are beyond reproach and all relevant confounding variables have been controlled for. Now let's uh, examine a few principles. It seems to me that a person A's right to breathe smoke-free air uh, in situations where they are obliged to breathe the same air as B trumps B's right to smoke. And for example, in the prison in which I used to work, a doctor attempted, rightly in my view, to accommodate prisoners uh, who did not uh, smoke in smoke-free cells when they shared cells. Of course, it's, there aren't very many uh, uh, non-smoking prisoners uh, because the statistical association between smoking and criminality is very, very strong. It's <laughs> It's uh, much stronger than the connection between poverty, uh, and it's much stronger than the uh, and criminality, and it's much stronger than that, uh, uh, the connection with unemployment, and it's very nearly as strong as the connection between criminality and tattooing. <laughs> I, uh, well, where children are concerned, the, the right to smoke-free air seems even uh, stronger. They cannot escape the environment into which they are born, and parents obviously have a duty of care to their children not to expose them knowingly to risks where there are no benefits accruing to them, that is to say the children, from those risks. But if we examine the particular prohibition with regard to, to private cars, in the first place, it doesn't seem that anyone has ever shown that smoking in cars is an independent risk factor for the development of any disease in children. It might be, and perhaps it is. But intuitive likelihood is not the same as evidence, much less of certainty. So uh, quite a stern prohibition is being proposed on the basis of knowledge that is more than usually complete, and it's likely to remain incomplete uh, for very obvious reasons. It's intrinsically difficult to disentangle the risk of smoke-breathed in cars from smoke-breathed elsewhere, including, of course, in homes. And it's obvious that many private cars are, are, are driven without transporting for children. Thus, a blanket prohibition is proposed to alter the behaviour of only a portion of the population, the alternative being a targeted prohibition uh, that would be more onerous possibly and intrusive to enforce than a blanket one. <coughs> uh, it is obvious also that prohibited, prohibiting uh, smoking in cars could be and would logically be but a first step to the prohibition of smoking in homes, or at least in homes where there are young children. And we should not disguise from ourselves the possibility that this would bring benefits as measured by admission of children to hospital for acute exacerbations of asthma, uh, for example. But unfortunately, benefits are rarely bought, brought without costs. And some of these costs are tangible, and uh, some intangible, and many are unforeseen. Uh, in a letter to the Times towards the end of 1939, for example, and shortly before his own death, the famous surgeon Wilfred Trotter pointed out that the blackout in Britain preparatory to German air bombing raids, which so far had not occurred, had resulted in a, a, an extra 600 fatal accidents on the roads of Britain. 600 people died as a result of that. Now, that is to say, the mere precaution killed 600 people. Nowadays, of course, we can, we can uh, conduct whole wars and bomb countries to smithereens with fewer casualties to ourselves, that is. And um, so there is progress. <laughs> now, I'll pass over the tangible costs of prohibition of smoking in cars, um, from economic ones to agitation in drivers, for example, causing more accidents. 
it's obvious that a prohibition first in cars and then logically in homes represents an increase in state power or control over the individual. The cost of this increase in control or loss of liberty cannot, of course, be measured uh, in the same units as the benefits uh, to children's health. The chief benefits and harms of the prohibition are probably incommensurable, and therefore people might disagree whether from a so-called rational point of view it is justified or not to prohibit uh, smoking in cars and homes. Is there more rejoicing in heaven over one hospital admission avoided than over 99 smoking parents who are allowed to continue? Well, what's clear from the, reading the medical journals is that there is never, or very rarely, any sense of dilemma in them. Uh, a ban would, would uh, produce X amount of health benefit, and therefore it should be instituted. The question of freedom does not even arise, let alone other costs. Of course, to a hammer, all things are a nail. Uh, to doctors, everyone is a, the uh, permanent possibility of an illness, just as John Stuart Mill defined matter as the permanent possibility of sensation. But uh, James Boswell once said, the world is not to be made a great hospital. And that is what we are increasingly doing. Since illness is, uh, by definition, something that one would wish to avoid, anything that helps avoid illness is ipso facto uh, justified. Unfortunately, health is one of those undoubted desiderata uh, that is affected by almost everything uh, that a man does. Uh, this is so even if one does not take uh, seriously the World Health Organization's sinister and totalitarian definition of health. The definition of health, according to the WHO, is health is a state of complete physical, mental, and so social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And this definition was written into the organization's founding constitution and has not been amended since 1948. It's still used and is often quoted. And I don't think it requires very much reflection to see that on such a definition of health, there is scarcely any, definition, uh, any extension of tyranny that could not be justified on grounds of public health. And of course there is a marked institutional tendency for public health authorities to act well uh, in advance of the evidence. For example, in the two countries in which I live, Britain and France, there have been uh, pub widespread publicity campaigns endorsed by the WHO, uh, which involve some kind of moral bullying, to get people to eat five portions of vegetables and fruit a day. Uh, th this, I hasten to add, is not for aesthetic reasons, um, but to improve the health of the population as we know, a meal is a medical, um, it's a medical uh, procedure. Uh, among the justifications offered for the campaign uh, that, of course, used up a considerable uh, amount of uh, res uh, resources uh, derived, or perhaps I should say extorted from taxpayers, was that eating five portions of fruit and vegetables a day would reduce the risk of cancer. And I will here pass over the difficult and perhaps impossible question of whether mounting propaganda campaigns actually changes people's behavior very much, let alone in the desired direction. Well, a recent uh, very large study involving more than half a million people in Europe demonstrated that those who ate five portions a day had a reduced risk of developing cancer of between 2 and 3 percent, not enough to be sure that the effect was caused by the difference in diet. After all, very few people differ only in the diet that they take and no other characteristics, and such a large study couldn't control for that. So we don't know whether uh, eating five vegetables a day is good for you or not, at least from the point of view of developing cancer. 
However, it's unlikely that this will have any effect whatever on the propaganda that is used for uh, two reasons, really. The first is that it would involve uh, an admission uh, that, uh, that uh, they were wrong. And secondly, um, the show must go on. But really it will also go on because we feel that people who do not eat fruit and vegetables are often stupid and badly educated and have appalling taste. Diet has long been thought to be the greatest key to health. The British physician, for example, George Chain, and I'm taking just one example, who lived between 1671 and 1748, already recommended exactly what is recommended now, that is to say exercise, a, a diet rich in vegetables and moderation in all things. Um, though it must be said that at one point he weighed more than 200 kilos and uh, he personally could not move around unaided. Uh, the difference is that Chain sought to persuade or convince his readers and his patients rather than compel them and in fact he used his own uh, bad example as a good example. But we now live in an age when official coercion for our own good uh, when the philosopher King is in firm alliance with the double-entry bookkeeper, and also in an age when intellectuals such as Richard Dawkins can seriously propagate the idea that to bring up a child in a religious belief is a form of child abuse, akin to sexual and physical abuse, uh, which he thinks perhaps should be rooted out by a public inquisition. Well, we, that's the world we live in. And government shepherds believe they have an infinite responsibility towards their flock, and the flock uh, believes it too, uh, in large part. Um, and there can be, of course, no responsibility without power. Anxiety is about the potential for the extension of tyranny over the population in the name of public health are actually quite old. Um, the Times, for example, in about 1848, said in a very famous uh, leader, that uh, we would prefer to take our chances with cholera than have the government dictate what water we should drink. And another a very important example, the struggle over smallpox vaccination in England and Wales during the 19th century and the first two or three decades of the 20th century it probably come as a surprise to you to know that the anti-vaccination movement was one of the strongest and most durable social movements of the 19th century, uh, and it published mass circulation journals continuously for 50 or 60 years. And it was a response to the British government's attempt in the 1850s to make the vaccination of children compulsory and instituted fines uh, for those parents who did not have their children vaccinated. Incidentally, um, uh, compulsion and vaccination in the United States is still quite, uh, quite common. Uh, the arguments of the vaccinate, anti-vaccinators were composed of two main strands. I, I have quite a large collection of anti-vaccination literature. The first of these was that vaccination was, as a matter of empirical fact, either useless or harmful, respons responsible for spreading such diseases as syphilis and even leprosy and also that it was ineffective against smallpox. Well, this is not a strand that I'm interested in here. There was a second strand according to which, even if compulsory vaccination were effective against smallpox, it would still not be justified because it would make the state and not the parents of children the arbiter as to how they, the children, should be best looked after and that this was the beginning of a slippery slope. Now, uh, interestingly, this was a movement that was predominantly working class. The working class was asking for protection from the state, not protection of the state. And I'll quote just one ditty uh, from the here to give you the flavour of, of the kind of thing that's said. Men of England, claim your freedom, make a noble stand, sweep the unjust law of tyrants from your native land. Strike the blow to vaccination, claim your liberty, sound the echo through the nation, Britons shall be free. 
Well, in the event, a, a, something like a compromise was reached in 1898, according to which parents could opt out of having their children vaccinated if they could persuade a magistrate uh, that they were conscientious objectors uh, to vaccination. It was the model for conscientious vaccination, uh, conscientious objection during the First World War. In any case, uh, as it happened, smallpox declined as a serious health threat in Western countries for a variety of reasons, only one of them vaccination, and the passion then went out of the whole controversy. Well, immunization against contagious disease is an interesting case because for most such diseases, somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of the population must be immune in order for there to develop uh, what is called herd immunity. That is to say, the non-immunized uh, that the non-immunized are protected against infection because an epidemic cannot take hold in the population. Well, the success of immunization campaigns in eradicating or controlling various contagious disease has, in my view, encouraged the epidemiologists and the public health doctors and governments ever since. Uh, that, and, of course, the discovery of the damaging effects of smoking also encouraged them. Uh, and they hope to repeat these trials for the common diseases which are currently of great significance, both in terms of morbidity and economically in Western populations, diseases such as hypertension, coronary artery disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, osteoarthritis, and various forms of cancer, which seem to be related to lifestyle. In most such cases, of course, causation is rather less clear-cut or well-established than it was for infectious diseases, or even the, uh, the connection between smoking and various kinds of disease. But nevertheless, varying uh, degrees, uh, uh, measures of varying degrees of coerciveness are proposed to reduce the burdens of these conditions, uh, from the contents of food uh, to denial of medical treatment to those whose lifestyle has uh, brought uh, on their own conditions. Well, the locus standi of public health authorities uh, to interfere in the lives of individuals of the general public derives in large part uh, from the fact that while the risks are taken by the individuals, the costs of consequent illness when it develops are borne by others uh, in the form of uh, either important uh, insurance or, of course, in Britain uh, by the state medical um, system. In other words, I smoke, but you pay for the treatment of my cancer. Uh, and the hope of many people in Britain, I think, is that eventually they'll have an extremely expensive um, procedure uh, which will more than pay back the amount of taxes that they have paid. Um, but, of course, it's not possible for everyone to get more out of the system than he has paid it. Nevertheless, that is the hope. Um, now, it's again obvious that people who pay the taxation um, uh, cannot be the administrators or controllers of it. And a class of bureaucrats charged with reducing costs or making, sometimes making profits um, charged with, with the administration and incidentally they are likely to transfer as much as possible of the money raised by taxation or insurance into their own personal uh, funds and this is not a neg negligible thing a British, uh, British former Minister of Health admitted shortly before the election that the increased amount of money spent on our state health system since 1997 had been very largely wasted, and this was not. These are not small sums. The British government deficit is currently running at 250. I, I get muddled up now. A trillion here, a trillion there. Soon we'll be talking your money. I think it's 250,000, 250 billion. That's it. 250 billion dollars. Without the extra expenditure on the health service, uh, it would have been 100 billion. So in other words, 40% of the deficit is caused not by the expenditure, but by the extra expenditure 
quite convincing with 1997. Well, epidemiology, you can see that in this situation, epidemiologists who discover connections, statistical or causal, between illness and risk factors, uh, give the government ammunition with which they uh, are able to interfere in the day-to-day -day life of the population, which of course is always a very pleasant task uh, for certain kinds of people. So freedom to what is really wanted is freedom to indulge in risky behavior on the one hand and insistence that someone else pays the cost for it on the other. And this is not likely to be compatible in the long run, though in the short run they're likely to, it is likely to uh, promote risky behavior, especially as the risky behavior is generally concentrated in the least economically productive and politically powerful uh, sector of the population. So the stage is set for dictatorial interference, endless dictatorial interference, in fact. Um, but this interference in a democratic age must be extended to everyone as, because it's likely to be both bullying and ineffectual. And the more ineffectual it is, uh, the more it must increase. Now, I don't think this problem is going to be solved in the near future. And it seems to me likely that healthcare will, it seems unlikely that the healthcare will revert ever to a system in which there's no third party payment. And therefore, I think there's going to be bullying uh, in the name of health for the foreseeable uh, future. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to end with a la one last plea. Epidemiology uh, demonstrates that by far the largest cause of injury in the developed world is uh, sport. Uh, in 1991, for example, 5% of the British population was injured sufficiently badly to necessitate hospital treatment while indulging in sport. And in fact, in 1996, the British Medical Journal reported that there were 19 million sports injuries a year in England and Wales. Uh, more than 19 million sports injuries a year in England and Wales. That's uh, about one or no, two per five, or two sports injuries per five for the population. Uh, and if you take the population most at risk, it's probably at least one a year and possibly two a year. So let, let's have, however, no nonsense about the health benefits of sport. Um, because the question, that's the wrong question. The right question is whether sports have health benefits uh, that are not available um, without the risks by some other uh, means. So ladies and gentlemen, I make one last plea. That is to say that we uh, ban sport and, uh, <clears throat> and criminalize it. <laughs> Thank you very much.